Welcome to the Betting Above the Rim podcast. Today's date, July 15th, episode 69. In today's podcast, we get into a bunch of topics fresh off a tighter than expected 98-92 win by the USA over Australia. We'll give you, I'll give you some of my thoughts on Team USA as they've played two exhibition games, with Serbia being the next game. Next, we go to the rookies, and there's been movement. I told you a while ago to jump on it, and now Zach Eady is the favorite to be Rookie of the Year. We'll relook at the Rookie of the Year odds based on what I've saw on Summer League so far, and maybe give you a value play as well. Next, we go to the Vegas Summer League, and I kind of give you three rookies that I've been really impressed with so far. Terrence Shannon Jr. of the Minnesota Timberwolves, Tristan Da Silva of the Orlando Magic, Stefan Castle of San Antonio, and one more, obviously, Reed Shepard in his play with the Houston Rockets. Next, we go to the women's side, to the W, and we look at the league-wide standings, and I give you Coach Young's top five, meaning the top five teams in reverse order, five to one in my power standings, and how that relates to the market to win the WNBA title with lines. Lastly, we'll end with a big topic of discussion, which was the ending of Angel Reese's streak. We'll talk about what happened that day. We'll talk about what happened in the game against Atlanta and the deliberately do the right thing and really making her earn it. Welcome to the Betting Above the Rim podcast. Let's get started with a USA winning 98-92 of a really, really pesky team in Australia. Uh, you know, when you look at this game, uh, Anthony Davis led the way with 17 points, 14 rebounds. Devin Booker off the bench, 16 points. Anthony Edwards in the starting lineup came out hot, didn't do much after that, 14 points. And then obviously looking at Australia, Jock Bond, uh, Longdale, who's been a lot of Kind of a good career in the NBA, 20.7 rebounds, 7 assists. Uh, Josh getting giddy with it, 17, 8, and 7. Shot the ball a lot more than he did with Oklahoma City this past year. And Dyson Daniels, the young player, with 14, 3, and 3. So when you start looking at this game, folks, you know, when I gave you my concerns with the USA, it, it was it was on a, it was on different things, right? Uh, It was on their ability to shoot the ball from three. It was on their rebounding. It was about their continuity as a team and less turnovers. And it was their defensive intensity, especially a team if they want to try and push the pace. So when you first look at the box score and you see the United States, you look at the box score and you look at the shooting and you say, oh, wow, they shot 12 to 29 from three, about 41.5%. Well, they shot 30% in the last game. So you look at that improvement and you think, that's really good. That's good that they did that. You know, the rebounding edge. Listen, when you got Joel Embiid, when you got Anthony Davis, you know, when you got Bam Adebayo as your bigs, you better win the rebounding battle. And they won it 45-40. to 40, But I have a little bit of concern with a couple of things off the jump with that. Number one, they gave up more offensive rebounds, 13, they secured themselves, 11. The second thing you have to look at is team shots, okay? They got, there was 11 more shots made by Australia, okay? Simply put, folks, Australia was god-awful from the three-point line going four for 18. Yes, you could absolutely attribute that to the defense, particularly on someone uh, you know, that, that's a really a three-point marksman like Patty Mills who only shot one of five from three. So you could kind of look at it and say, well, yeah, we defended the ball well. But to me, there's different ways to get out shot. Just getting out shot at the three-point line and it's just giving up more shots to the opponent. So you look at the fact that, think about this, folks. Uh, you know, we um, outshot them from three. We outshot them from the three-point line. They did something that I liked that we did. We made more shots from the free-throw line than our opposition took. That's always a good sign. We won the rebounding battle. We had more steals. We had more assists. We forced more fouls. But here's where the concerns come in, folks. Number one, 18 turnovers. They are sometimes our guys reckless with the ball, and they're not reckless in a bad way doing fancy passes. They're reckless with the ball as if they don't know each other. When you play these international teams, they are in this international pool for a long time. 
they're more used to playing with each other. I, I remember seeing a play, I think it was early in the second half, where, you know, Joel B got the ball at the top of the key, LeBron James cut back door or in the second quarter, and he threw it out of bounds because, you know, I, I think MB thought it was popping, LeBron was cutting. That that's not reckless in regards to fancy passing. It's reckless because they just haven't played together enough. And that's something that you have to think about could be a concern. Number two, simply put, if Australia shoots better than four of 18 for the three-point line, they win. They win. If they shot a respectable six for 18, 33%, we're in overtime. You know, that's six points right there. So we have to, while we won the three-point line, Australia didn't shoot the ball well. So if a team gets hot on three, we could be in trouble. Our defense in the paint was god-awful. And it starts with wing ball pressure. You're looking at a team like Australia. They don't have guys that are big scorers. Like Jacques Londale is, is not a big scorer. He had 20 points. Folks, now you're talking the floor. Eight of ten from the from two. They were layups. Jack Landell's not a guy you throw a ball in the post and say, go get me a bucket. Jack Landell's a guy you drive the ball and you get a pocket pass and he gets a layup. So I think that's the thing that kind of concerned me is the fact that, you know, seven assists for Giddy. I mean, even Landell had six assists himself. It was the fact that we didn't defend the paint. You know, it's funny, there's a good friend of mine, he's one of the best high school coaches in the state of New Jersey named George Sorless. And George used to have a phrase called, uh, defend the king, right? I used to say as a coach, protect the president. Um, And so to me, you have to defend the lane. When you allow teams to get into the paint and create, bad things happen. We have to do a better job of defending the paint. Also, we got to make sure that we continue to put teams away because we were really good in the first half, up by, I think, 17 or 18 points. We got to come out with better effort in the second half and put teams away. Simply put, the USA did not cover. They scored well. They defended like crap. Last game, they struggled to score. They defended great. We still have not seen the best out of USA basketball. So they've shown they've won different ways. They still should win absolutely the gold medal but they're playing with fire a little bit with their play, especially when you get to the medal round and all it takes is one game to lose. Next game USA will take on will be Nikola Jokic and Serbia. Let's move on to the rookie of the year odds where it was 20 to one when he got drafted the night after. All of a sudden folks, Zach Eady has run up the board and he's the leader at six to one to be rookie of the year. Reed Shepard at seven to one, Sar is at eight to one with Risha Shea. Bazellus, who had a big game last night for uh, Chicago, is 9 to 1. Dalton Connect also 9 to 1. And then Castle, 11 to 1. Ron Holland, 14 to 1. Rob Dillingham, 15 to 1. And Cody Williams, 20 to 1. You're going to put Zach here because you figure with the way he played at Purdue, and he's going to get more one on one matchups in the NBA, and he's going to be surrounded by better shooters is that he's going to be pretty doggone good. And if you get Zach Eady 25 minutes a night, I think you're getting 15 points and nine rebounds. When you look at the rest of those guys, you don't find a lot of guys that I think are going to score big numbers. You could say that, you know, Zach Eady will get it around the basket. Yes, they have Desmond Bain. Yes, they have John Morant. Yes, they have Jaron Jackson Jr. But he's going to get his because he's going to open it up for everyone else because the times they're going to play inside out with Memphis. When you look at you know a, a guy that I think uh, could be a sleeper uh, for rookie of the year, if we pull the odds back up, eleven to one, folks. I want you to look at, and that's Stefan Castle, and that's going to lead me to uh, the next point I want to make, which is rookies that are impressing me and Summer League, and Stefan Castle has been one of them. You know, if you look at his his splits, right, 11.1 points per game, 2.9 assists per game. Folks, he was used completely different than how he was used, obviously, playing uh, for UConn. He was a 3-and-D guy, a punch-the-gap kind of guy. 
but it's different how he's being used. If you go and you look back on the game that he played on Saturday in the rookie matchup versus Donovan Klingon, you know, you saw Castle play really, really well, folks. Look at his stat line. 22 points. Yeah, he shot two or six from three. Five rebounds, four assists, showed a playmaking ability, and really good in the pick and roll. I, I was really impressed at his, at his demeanor and his ability to create off the bounce and kind of get things going. I think Stefan Castle at 11 to 1 is an absolute steal right now. And I think he, honestly, right now I'm going to say this I think he's going to have the best career out of all of them. I said that the day after the draft, I think he's going to have the best career. There's no slight. To anyone else there, I just personally think that he's going to have a great career and probably the best. Moving on, another guy that I have been really impressed with, and I love where he went, is Terrence Shannon Jr. Folks, he's not even up there for rookie of the year. He's probably, I don't even know, and, and Matt, my producer can look it up and tell me in my ear as, as we get going. I think he's probably at least 20 to 25 to 1. Um, but this is a guy that is a walking bucket. And I think he could get double figures coming off the bench. Very simply put, his second game, you know, against Indiana last night, 6 of 11, 7 8 from the floor, 19 points plus 15, plays good defense, three blocks, two steals. So he's going to be a guy that you could see at times if it's late game Minnesota, they could go Mike Conley, Terrence Shannon Jr., Anthony Edwards, Jalen McDaniels, and then obviously go to a center like Rudy Gobert, play McDaniels as a four, because Shannon Jr. at six foot six, 210 pounds, is bulky enough where he can guard twos and you can have Ant go to the three. He's 50, he's 50 to one. 50 to one right now is Terrence Shannon Jr. to be rookie of the year. I'm going to say this right now. Terrence, Terrence Shannon Jr. is going to score in the NBA. He's going to get you at least 10, 11 points in that second unit with Rob Dillingham. And all you need is an injury, an unfortunate injury. L let's say Cat goes down. So when it's been hurt a lot, you could slide McDaniels to the floor and to the three and put Terrence Shannon Jr. into the starting lineup. Because so I don't think they'll put uh, Rob Dillingham in the starting lineup. I think the only chance Rob Dillingham starts is to me is if Mike Connolly gets hurt. There's more of a pathway here for Terrence Shannon Jr., a guy that's a walking bucket and can play NBA-level defense because of playing for Brad Underwood at Illinois, and he's mature, and he's older, and he's going to be good. The next guy that I've been – I'm not saying I got it wrong. All I got to say is we got to stop devaluing these Kentucky guys when they come out. We just have to. Cal may not do the best job of coaching them, but he gets them ready. Reed Shepard – has been absolutely fantastic. Didn't shoot the ball well from three last game, only one of five from three, but 22 points, six rebounds, seven assists, five steals, and a block. This guy can score, but he can also defend at an extremely high level. Don't mistake the six foot three, 187 pound fool you. He's quick twitch, he's got great lateral, lateral quickness, he can block shots as a guard, and he can get up in passing lanes. He is going to be so fun to watch with this Houston Rockets team, and it really presents a really interesting scenario for Emil Doka of how he attacks this with this team. Do you go with, like, at times, Shepard, Van Vliet, Jalen Green, three-guard lineup? Yeah, that's going to be pretty small at six, you know, six foot and six three, but Reed Shepard plays above his size because of his athletic ability uh, and his quick twitch and his long arm to be able to defend. Reed Shepard has been fantastic. And as much as I've loved the combination of Rob Dillingham and Terrence Shannon Jr., there is not. And Reed Shepard right now is his second favorite at 7-1 to one to be Rookie of the Year. See, this is why I think it's difficult because I don't know where the pathway is unless they go three-guard alignment and then they go with uh, Jabari Smith at the four uh, with a Farron Shungun at the five, which could be a possibility. But besides you know, Dillingham and Terry Cheney Jr., the best one-two punch I've watched all summer league, Reed Shepard and Cam Whitmore. 
I mean, I am so fired up. I everybody knows that I, I'm, I'm a Villanova guy. I love Villanova. Uh, I, I love Cam Whitmore's game. I thought that you know he kind of fell in the draft for some some very unfortunate reasons. I'm gonna I'm gonna put it at that. Uh, but I think that he is going to be absolutely fantastic. Uh, the way he played. The last one, really quick, Tristan De Silva. Now, the thing about De Silva, folks, is De Silva playing at Colorado, maybe you didn't get a chance to see enough of Tristan play over his time at Colorado playing for Tad Boyle. But let me tell you something about this kid. This kid can defend, and he's uber smart. I, I kind of said it to people as, uh, I think I, I referred to him as Kyle Anderson with a jump shot. And I love, everybody knows I love slow-mo, slow-mo Anderson. But this performance he had against New Orleans when he had 23 points, 3 to 6 from 3, 4 rebounds, 2 assists, 2 steals, he showed a propensity to knock down shots, create off the bounce, create for others, can be a little bit of a point forward. The Magic Man hit a home run with the Silva. I, I, and I really have liked his game. I think he presents an interesting second unit uh, with, with the Silva, uh, with a guy like a, like a Wagner who has come back. Uh, I think they give them some depth and someone that could actually secretly folks handle the ball a little bit uh Tristan De Silva the Orlando Magic are going to be a really intriguing team to watch because they overachieved last year we will see how they do this year let's end the podcast today going to the WNBA and looking at two topics number one uh the league is coming up on their Olympic break uh they'll have some games this week I think by Wednesday or Thursday I think they're going Olympic break for a month. So I thought at this point, it would be good for me to pull up uh, the season-long standings and then give you, after we pull up the standings in regards to odds to win the WMA title, my top five. So the, the best team right now in the WMA record-wise is the New York Liberty at 20 and four. They won their last game. We'll get to that a little bit versus Chicago. No Brianna Stewart. Uh, and obviously, uh, you know, no Bernard Laney Hamilton uh, for the New York Liberty. Second best record, Connecticut Sun, 18 and 5. Do know that the New York Liberty have a tiebreaker advantage. They won both games versus Connecticut Sun, both in the Mohican Sun Arena. Third best record, they made it all the way back. Uh, and that's the Las Vegas Aces, winners of 10 of the last 11 games since the point god Chelsea Gray has returned. Pull up that, uh, the standings again, Matt, please. Uh, Minnesota Lynx at 16 and 8. They lost their last game. Do know that's more of the fact that you have an injury uh, to um, Nafisha Collier, who did not play last game. Tied with that record is the Seattle Storm at 16 and 8. And then Phoenix intriguing at 6. And then there is the Indiana Fever at 7. Folks, two big wins in the last two weeks. They won at uh, they were, they won two nights ago, or last night, I should say, on Sunday, in a big game and a comeback performance, uh, being down 7 going into the fourth quarter and stunning uh, the Minnesota Lynx on Sunday uh, with a huge fourth quarter on the road. Big win. Only be outdone by the win they had the weekend before is when they beat the New York Liberty and that fantastic performance. Watch this Connecticut Sun team. And Connecticut Sun, it's Indiana Fever team, folks. They are gelling. It is because of the play of Aaliyah Boston. It's the play of, of obviously, uh, Clark. Uh, but it's all the other players um, that are playing well as well. Caitlin Mistral, uh, uh, Melissa Smith, who missed the last game. Um, so they've been playing really good basketball. Now if you bring up the standings, really the, the odds to win the WNBA championship, the A- Vegas Aces are at plus 140, Liberty at plus 180, Connecticut Sun at 8.5, Lynx at 9.5, tied with Seattle Storm. So I'm going to do this in reverse order. My top five in reverse order, Matt, keep this up. Okay, my top five in reverse order are I have Seattle right now as the number four, five team in the WNBA. Awuma K and Skylar Diggins Smith has been great additions to this team, along with Joel Lloyd and Megaburg. They have a good and they play really good defense. Number four, I'm going to go with Connecticut. My, my issues with Connecticut are more the fact that I know they had a really big win versus Mercury with a huge second half. They don't shoot the ball well from three. And I think that's going to be their problem, and that's going to be their Achilles heel going forward. They're my number four team. Number three, I'm going to go with the Minnesota Lynx. 
I just love what Cheryl Reeve does as a coach. I know they're missing Nafisha Kelly the last couple of games. They get Nafisha back. They should be really ready to go. Number two, I'm going New York. I'm going New York because I just think that the Vegas Aces are just playing at a different level with Chelsea Gray. 10 out of 11, they've won. And I just think at times, until Stewie and that team knock off the Aces with the point guard, with Kelsey Plum, with, with Jackie Young, and with the best player in the world, and the way she's playing is not even close, Asia Wilson, I mean, Lord have mercy. How, how do you take anyone else right now to win the WNBA championship? With her averaging 27.2 points per game and 11.9 assists, who has gotten, folks, ready? Ready for this? I want you to think about this. She has gotten 55 rebounds in the last three games. 55 rebounds and 75 points. She's averaging 25 and 15 the last three games. All wins. She's playing dynamite basketball, the best basketball, crazy to say this, the best basketball of her career, Asia Wilson. If you want to go a little bit deeper, you can look at the play of Jackie Young. I know she struggled last game versus the Mystics, but up to 18.5 points per game has settled into her role now as the two guard with Chelsea Gray coming back. And this is a person that has scored before last game against Mystics. She had scored 18 plus points. And the previous, <coughs> excuse me, five games, and if you go back that even further, seven of the previous eight, Jackie Young has been absolutely fantastic since the point guard has come back. You want to go look at Kelsey Plum? Let's look at Kelsey Plum. 22 points last game, <coughs> excuse me, 18.8 points per game. She is obviously their shooter. She's a three-point marksman. She's one of the best shooters in the world. And she's shooting the ball from three at 37.4%, a little bit down from her career average. So if she gets that up to 40%, where she normally is, watch out. Because of Becky Hammond, because of Asia Wilson, because of the point guard, Chelsea Gray, because of Jackie Young, because of, you know, Kelsey Plum, until someone shows me different, <clears throat> and the Liberty have one win already over the Aces, they are the best team in the W. Now, I want everybody to circle the first game out of the Olympic break. Saturday, August 17th, New York plays Vegas. That is going to be a huge game. And if the Liberty were to beat Vegas, again, they'd have a 2-0 series lead in regards to regular season play of the tiebreaker. They're going to have a 2-0 lead versus the Connecticut Sun. And the biggest thing about what I'm about to say with the New York Liberty is this. Folks, they would win the season series, and all those games they've played versus Connecticut and the Aces, those would all be on the road. If they win that game August 17th, come back to me. I may say the Liberty is a team to beat to win the WNBA title. Let's end today's podcast with Angel Reese. And Angel Reese, that before I say anything, I want people to understand something right now. This is not hate. This is not hate. I love watching this kid play. She plays so hard. She chases down rebounds like she's Dennis Rodman. She's giving you 13.5, 12 rebounds, 1.8 assists, half a block, 1.5 steals. And she's shooting at 76% for the line. But she's shooting it at 40.2% from the the floor. I'm not going to even bring up the three-point shooting because let's be honest, that is not Angel Reese's game. The reason why I'm bringing it up is because over the weekend, her double-double streak ended with a loss to the New York Liberty where she had eight points at the end of possession. And there was, I don't want to say, there was a little bit of controversy on how the Liberty defended last play. Just, I'm sure we all know, they basically quadruple team there. Played a box in one, box on Angel, one on everyone else. She didn't get the shot off. She looked frustrated. She walked off the court. She did not get the double-double. Simply put, folks, she can't get it if she shoots 3 of 13 from the floor. She can't get it if she gets 3 of 11 from the 
from inside the lane. She can't get it if she goes three of 10 from the charge circle, inside the charge circle. That's a little like half moon under the basket where you have to have your body outside of it, feet down in order to it to count. So to me, when you look at that game, it, 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 it's very simply put, she didn't shoot the ball well. And that's, a, that's something that she's got to improve on. A person that shoots that close to the basket has got to shoot better than three of 10 inside the charge circle. So I don't want to hear anybody talking about how upset they are and, 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 and like, oh, they, there's hate, there's this, there's that. Simply put, she's got to finish better around the basket. She's got to finish better around the basket. If she finishes better around the basket, then she's going to be fine. But to me, for people to kind of make some kind of talk about, oh, the hate and oh, the this, the oh, the that. No, I don't want to hear it. She's got to finish better. Simply put. And if she finishes better, she's going to be great. She's an effective field goal percentage of 40.6%. She's a true shooting percentage of 47.6%. She's getting the attempts. She's got to finish. Simply put, and if she finishes the way she's capable of, she's going to get double-doubles every night. I get it. It's, it's, it's very simply put, okay? Angel needs to stop worrying about creating fouls and worry about making shots. I think she tries too hard to create contact. She flails her arms, and it makes it at times very difficult for a player to officiate. It's very tough to officiate in their games because you don't know what she is, you know, what what's her 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 thought process. What is she trying to do? Right? She's got to get better. 65% of her shots are points that she scores are points in the paint. Imagine if she shoots them at 60% in the paint and not 40. You wouldn't be talking about double doubles. You'd be talking about 15 and 15 every night. And you'd be talking about someone that'd be talked about for being all M WNBA first or second team. This has been your Betting Above the Rim podcast for July 15th. For all things sports gambling, download that sports grid app pre game, in game, post game, props, predictions, and more for the very best in the sports gambling industry. Next podcast will come, we'll shoot it on Tuesday with the WNBA going to break after Wednesday. It'll be a good way to do a halfway point and kind of reevaluate the market. We'll preview the WNBA also game and we'll get more talk for the Olympics. For my producer, Maddie George, Vinny with the graphics. Thanks for listening, folks. Remember, it's smarter to be on Sports Grid. Good night. My man.